toward the eyes and ears of our minds seem to be open 24-7. So often they overshadow the eyes and ears of our spirits. And yet it is our spirits that hear you long before our minds take in what you have said. Open now the eyes and the ears of our spirits. Help us not only to hear your message, but to see the very special star that you give each one of us to light our way. In Christ we pray. Amen. The this morning, we take a final look at the realities and folklore of the nativity. Folklore has sort of accumulated over the centuries, and there is a tendency at this point in time to kind of get them confused. They sort of get intertwined, and we can miss some of the important message of the nativity. Where the Magi are concerned, I suspect confusion has as much to do with the issue as folklore does. As we said at the outset of this sermon series, there's a very great human tendency to add in details to a story when the author hasn't quite given us as many details as we feel we need. And that's especially the case as the story becomes increasingly important. So consider how your own thoughts about the Magi do and do not find support in the biblical account as I read Matthew 2, 1 through 12. Listen for the word of God. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. And they told him, in Bethlehem of Judea. For so it has been written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then 
opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. This is the word of the Lord. As is the case with most events in Jesus' life, the journey of the Magi to Bethlehem is not written down in any history book. No historian made special note of it. In his commentary on Matthew, Edward Schweitzer, who was a professor at the University of Zurich for many years, tells the following, quote, in AD 66, astrologers from Persia in the company of King Tiridates came to Nero at Naples because of certain prophecies in the stars to worship him as king of the universe in the west and then return by another route. It was AD 66. Matthew's gospel was written sometime after AD 70. The best scholarly work suggests somewhere between 80 and 90 AD, or what we now call BCE, or CE, Common Era. Whether he was aware of King Tiridates' visit to Nero in Naples, we don't know. Matthew may have been aware of that, and he may not have been, but it's clear that such pilgrimages were not uncommon for that time. To begin our attempt to discern possible reality about the Magi, we start with the question, who or what were the Magi? The Jewish annotated New Testament, which brings Jewish tradition and culture to bear on the meaning of the New Testament writings, says that the Magi were Zoroastrian priests, but it also says that early readers of Matthew's Gospel, early Jewish readers of Matthew's Gospel, would also have thought that they were Persian astrologers. But as such, they would not have been considered wise they would have been considered to be foolish. Connecting Matthew's account of Jesus' birth with Isaiah 60, verse 10, just a little bit beyond where Chris read, which says, kings will serve you. Some commentators suggest that the Magi were kings They obviously were wealthy based on the gifts that they brought the Christ child, but that does not necessarily make them kings. Still other commentators accept that the Magi were learned astrologers who studied the stars and the planets. There's a very interesting account in Dr. Kenneth Bailey's book, which you have heard me mention several times in this sermon series. He tells the anecdote of a British scholar named E.F.F. Bishop. In the 1920s, Mr. Bishop visited a Bedouin tribe in Jordan. The Arabic name of the tribe means those who study and follow the planets. He asked this Bedouin tribe why they had that name. And their answer was that because their ancestors followed the planets and traveled west to Palestine to show honor and homage to the great prophet Jesus when he was born. I think we would agree that studying the planets and the stars 
recognizing that a special heavenly feature signaled the birth of a king and then going to find that king and pay him homage is not what we would call foolish. Matthew could probably have included more details about who these magi were, but he didn't. Such details were not important to Matthew. It's not the point that he was trying to make. That important point actually had more to do with who and what the Magi were not. An interesting bit of folklore has to do with how many Magi visited the Christ child. Do you know? Listen again to verse 1 in chapter 2. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men came from the east to Jerusalem. It doesn't say how many. That was an insignificant bit of trivia to Matthew. Most likely, down through the ages, people have matched up the three gifts with three men. But there could have been more or fewer. Matthew doesn't say that Jesus received three gifts. He says that Jesus received gold, frankincense, and myrrh. There could have been many treasure chests of gold, many of frankincense, and many of myrrh. We really don't know. Again, for Matthew, the number of gifts was not an important matter. Some scholars have suggested that the importance of the three gifts was what they symbolized gold symbolizing a king, frankincense a deity, and myrrh embalming, having to do with the death of this one that had been born. Possibly the greatest bit of confusion is the starting place for the journey. The text says, that they were from the east and that they saw a star in the east and followed it. Well, now think about that. If they started out in the east and they followed a star that they saw in the east, the likelihood is they wouldn't have ended up in Israel, they would have ended up in India. Now we can understand partially what's happening here if we think about how we use the word east. If we live in Arizona, east is the Mississippi River. In Massachusetts, that's not east, that's west. Bailey tells us that people living in the Holy Land consider east to be the eastern side of the Jordan River. So Magi coming from the east would have been coming from someplace east of the Jordan River. They would have come from the east, but they would have traveled west. Now also contributing to the confusion is the fact that the Hebrew word for east can also be translated as the rising. If we use that definition of that Hebrew word, 
we get the translation used in the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible, which is the translation from which I just read. For we have seen his star at its rising and have come to worship him. In other words, the star they saw was most likely in the western sky. The Magi saw that star at its rising, and like the Christmas star that has been so much on our minds and been so intriguing this past week, that star was likely in the western sky. Matthew could have been a bit more specific about where the Magi lived, but he wasn't. That wasn't important to Matthew. Now, for those who really want to know where the, Ma the Magi called home, the answer is that they were most likely from southern Arabia. The way we know that is that they were east of Israel, and frankincense and myrrh are harvested from trees that grow only in southern Arabia. As for the gold, well, that has long been a possession of the wealthy. That is kind of held universally. It was important to Matthew to include the specific gifts that they brought, but it wasn't important exactly where they lived. Well, so far, we have heard a lot about what was not important to Matthew about the Magi's visit to the Christ child. Sort of begs the question, what was important? Well, I'm glad you asked. We get a big clue if we widen the scope a little bit and include the shepherds who also visited the Christ child. The shepherds were everything the Magi were not. They were Jewish, poor, at least financially, and uneducated. The Magi were Gentiles, wealthy, and educated. We'll explore the meaning of this difference a bit further next week as we take a final look at the Magi. But here it's important to note that Matthew was very much concerned to make the important point that Jesus came for everyone. The Messiah came for everyone. He came for the Jews and the Gentiles. He came for the rich and the poor. He came for the educated and the uneducated, for the rulers and for the ruled. He came to save us all from the power of our own sinful nature and that phrase, our own sinful nature, applies to everybody. The rich, poor, learned, uneducated, rulers ruled. And that mission was of immeasurably more importance than release from the oppressive rule of unjust and sometimes insane Roman rulers. The Magi and the shepherds did have one thing in common, though. They accepted and believed God's revelation. 
Not only did the Magi recognize Jesus to be divine, a divine king, born a king, not made a king by human beings. They also believed in and paid attention to revelation that came in dreams. Both the Jewish Joseph and the Gentile Magi were warned by God in a dream to protect Jesus from Herod. And both of them obeyed that dream. Only God can give that kind of spiritual awareness, an awareness that leaves no doubt as to the reality of the message spoken to our spirits. The Magi did not accept only what they read in books about science or what scientists taught them. They also accepted what God revealed to their spirits. They no doubt knew the difference between scientific knowledge and spiritual revelation. But they traveled, but they believed and they acted upon their belief in both. There's only one way to know that Jesus is the Christ, and that is by God's revealing it to us. There's no condition on our part that has to come before that revelation. We do not need to profess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, before we can be given that revelation. That is our first revelation. We do not need to be the member of a certain church or a certain tradition. We don't even have to be a certain age. We don't have to be well-educated. We don't have to have ever stepped one foot across the threshold of a church door. God prepares us to receive God's revelation, and God puts God's love for him and for others in our hearts. For our part, we can choose to accept the revelation and love and live accordingly, or we can choose to block that revelation in order to follow our own principle by which we live, a principle that follows our own human authority, interests, and desires. The basic question here is, Who's in charge? Who are we following? Who leads the way? The Magi did not chart their course before they set out for Bethlehem. They didn't explore all sorts of different routes to a destination because they really didn't know for sure what their destination was. They simply set out and they followed the lead that the God who provided the star gave them. I think that Matthew would have us know not only that all people are in need of salvation, 
and that the Messiah came for all people, but also that all people need God's revelation. Let us take Matthew's gospel to heart. Let us seek the light that God has for us as we continue on life's journey. Let us be open to receiving what God would reveal to us and act accordingly. Act on whatever God reveals to us. Let us not disregard revelation just because it doesn't come from a book on science or someone with scientific knowledge. Let us look toward the heaven over our own life's path and look for the light. Look for the star that God places in the heaven that is over our path, and let us follow that star.